Yeah. Hi, my name is Keaton, as you can see, that's me. Um, so my presentation today is on the automatic segmentation of coronary calcifications and aortic substructures in NAF PET CT images using convolutional neural networks. So before I begin, quick thanks to Martin and Pedgman who have been instrumental in guiding my research and putting me in contact with a bunch of deep learning experts, uh, such as Jake, for instance. Big thank you to Jake, Nathaniel, and the rest of the machine learning cluster who have been really, really helpful uh, throughout the project so far. So firstly, what is the principal aim of my project? Well, quite simply, it's investigating the use of deep learning techniques to streamline cardiac substructure delineation. And from that, uh, radiometric uh, extraction for cardiovascular disease patients at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital. So we can break it down into three components. The first is the design and optimization of a convolutional neural network to delineate the coronary artery and a variety of aortic substructures in CT calcium score images, uh, such substructures as ascending uh, aorta, descending aorta, and so forth. And subsequently, from those delineations, we extract intensity-based and geometric-based radiomic measures um, from the spatially registered PET and CT images, and we use that to develop predictive models uh, to measure a patient's respective risk, but also compare it to manual delineations which leads us to the final part, which is at all stages conducting an economic comparison. So comparing the accuracy and efficiency of deep learning techniques with manual delineations to see whether or not we can integrate it into the clinical workflow. So before I begin, let's look at the main focus or the significance of my project, which is cardiovascular diseases. So this is a quick breakdown of the top 10 causes of death in Australia in 2019. As you can see, isochemic heart disease Isochemic, just meaning the restriction of blood flow, takes the top spot, uh, beating out dementia and diabetes. So it's an especially abhorrent uh, disease. In fact, 18 million people succumb to cardiovascular diseases in 2019 alone. It accounted for 11% of deaths in Australia. And importantly, of those who experience a major cardiac event, uh, in the next three years, 30% are expected uh, to re require rehospitalization or will unfortunately die. So, what is the principal cause behind this? Well, atherosclerosis is a clinical term. It's the pathological accumulation of calcium and cholesterol on the arterial walls. And there are two mechanisms by which this can lead to a cardiovascular event. The first is stable plaque buildup, which is a very gradual process, slowly restricting blood flow. And the more relevant is unstable plaque, whereby the plaque can rupture and suddenly obstruct uh, importantly, unpredictably obstruct blood flow linked to heart attack, stroke. And this is ideally what we'd like to prevent or identify. So the way we quantify it is by use of a coronary artery calcium score, which is highly correlated with cardiovascular diseases. As we can see here uh, on a CT slice image, the white region corresponds to the calcium deposit. Now, how do we know they're correlated? Well, there's a variety of uh, studies. One of the most conclusive was one conducted by Budoff et Alia. Um, they used a multi-ethnic study uh, on a cohort of around 7,000 patients, adjusting for age, ethnicity, sex, and a variety of other factors. So they found that with a CAC score of, that's in a Gatston units, of uh, zero, the incidence in t over 10 years for a cardiovascular event was around 5%. The second that rose to over 300, the incidence quintupled and nearly a quarter of all patients are expected to experience some major event. So there's a high degree of correlation. So what can we actually do about it? In short, not much. So there are drug administration therapies which have shown minimal to no reversal of CAC scores, such as this one conducted by Manus Calco in 2004 uh, using EDTA and the antibiotic tetracycline. Um, the second is lifestyle modification. So introducing exercise regimens, uh, changing the eating habits of the patients. Uh, however, there was no statistically relevant change in CAC progression uh, in this study conducted by Lehman uh, in 2011. Um, and lastly, the most invasive is surgical invent intervention. However, this is typically reserved for high-risk category patients, patients who are currently experiencing heart attack, stroke, uh, where the obstruction has to be immediately removed. So, the result of this is a lot of research is directed less towards therapy and more towards diagnosis and prediction of an individual patient's risk factor. So how do we do that? Well, this brings us to my study, which is focusing on combining CT with a sodium fluoride PET scan. Now, CT, sorry, PET excels in identifying 
microcalcifications, which uh, the CT scan cannot actually resolve because it, they're simply too small. Um, so what they found is that there is a high correlation between calcium and sodium fluoride, but more importantly, there are two pieces of information that the PET scan provides that the CT can't. Firstly, there is high uptake in regions where no calcium is visible on the CT scan, and there is no uptake in regions where there is very obviously calcium on the CT scan. So this tells us there is a mutual exclusivity of the information supplied by PET and CT, which is why they complement each other so well. Um, so what is the PET scan actually identifying that the CT can't? Well, it's regions of microcalcification. Um, and this is particularly characteristic of ongoing uh, mineralization, which you find in unstable patients, patients whose atherosclerosis is progressively getting worse. Furthermore, microcalcification is a strong predictor of plaque rupture, um, and therefore it's, it's helpful to identify unstable plaque in the patients. All right. So how does this all tie in with deep learning? I understand not all of us know about deep learning, so I'm going to have a quick introduction into uh, deep learning architectures, starting with the most basic one, which consists of three components, an input layer, an output layer, and an unspecified number of hidden layers. So data propagates through these in a vectorized, in a linear algebraic fashion, where inputs are vectorized, and to progress to the next layer, they're multiplied by a matrix of weights. So how do we actually improve the model? Well, we, it, it improves by a process known as backpropagation, where we run predictions and the results of those predictions are used to iter iteratively adjust the weights of each of the nodes using this gradient descent formula. If this is a little bit mathematical for you, it's a lot easier to visualize it graphically. Here we have a 3D representation in the top right of a cost function, and over each iteration of the training data, the model navigates through that landscape looking to minimize the cost and therefore improve the accuracy of the model's predictions. So there's a couple of methods we can use to improve the performance, such as adjusting the learning rate, making far we don't say overshoot one of those, those troughs, um, stochastic batch and mini gradient descent, which compromises uh, computational power required with uh, uh, the accuracy of the model and normalized in initialization. So, Unfortunately, if your inputs are images, when you vectorize the images, you lose all spatial, spatial information. It's like representing a picture as a series of ones and zeros. It's useless. So to compensate for that, we introduce a different operator known as the convolutional layer. So in each convolutional layer, we apply a series of filters to the image, such as a Gaussian blur or a horizontal line to respectively get rid of noise or extract the horizontal features. In reality, a convolutional layer will include around about maybe 64 of these filters. However, you can adjust it as necessary. And these learn to extract only the most pertinent features from the model to improve the prediction. Um, subsequently, it's followed by a pooling layer, which is a downsampling opera uh, operator. Um, you can sort of think of it like downgrading from 720p on YouTube to 360. The idea is you get rid of the unnecessary features and only leave the most pertinent features for your model to assess and use in the final prediction. So this is what a final convolutional neural network might look like. So we have a series of convolutional layers followed by max pooling layers, that downsampling operation, and finally ending with a fully connected layer, which is quite reminiscent of what you saw on the previous slide. So now let's look at how this relates directly to my project, finally. All right. So this study conducted by Morris et al. was a direct comparison of deep learning techniques. The deep learning model they used was 3D UNET, which is sort of like the gold standard for biomedical segmentation. And they compared it with one of the best non-deep learning uh, architectures or non-deep learning segmentation algorithms, which is the multi-atlas technique. Um, it was conducted on CT MRI fusion images for, uh, to identify 12 cardiac substructures in 32 patients and they quantified their results using the dice coefficient and the mean distance to agreement, which I'll go into in a second. So a lot to take in, but importantly, if you look towards the bottom, le bottom left graph, we see that the mean distance to agreement, which is the distance between the predicted segmentation and the correct segmentation, so lower the better, the deep learning model in red outperformed the multi-atlas techniques in every sub substructure. Furthermore, the dice coefficient, which is a measure of overlap, so the bigger the better, uh, once again, it outperformed the non-deep learning model. 
So this here is a demonstration of the high potential of deep learning models for integration into uh, the clinical workflow. And there on the bottom right, you can see some visualizations of those segmentations. All right, so in a more project-specific study conducted by Piri et Alia, this was actually conducted in May of this year, so it's still quite a novel research area. Um, they compared a convolutional neural network uh, with a manual delineator, and to achieve this, they actually used a NAF PET scan uh, and CT fusion data set, and they delineated cardiac substructures and subsequently extracted radiomic uh, intensity measures, such as the SUV total, mean, and max. And what they found was quite telling. Um, the convolutional neural network had minimal to neg neg negligible difference between the uh, manual delineator in the SUV mean, max, and total values. But importantly, it was vastly more efficient. It was able to output results in a matter of minutes compared to the hours it would take for an expert reviewer to go through and contour these uh, sequences manually. Uh, as well as there was zero, uh, there is actually zero uh, variation in a convolutional neural network's predictions. So whether you plug in a picture today or next week on a fully trained model, you'll get the same results, which obviously can't be said for a manual reviewer. All right, so this leads me to my study plan. Um, firstly, I will be working with the VikaVac data set. VikaVac stands for uh, the effects of vitamin K and culture seen on vascular calcifications um, on diabetic patients. Uh, not totally necessary, but uh, what happened was over a period of two years, around 160 patients were admitted to rural Perth Hospital and they underwent uh, sodium fluoride PET scans and CT calcium score scans at baseline and um, follow-up, which was three months later. Um, from this data set, on, also the data set is, exists in MIM, which I was able to export using a variety of Python libraries I'll go into later. But the first step is to design a convolutional neural network to delineate the coronary artery and the aortic region substructures. Um, I'm starting my research with multi-res UNET, which is an extension of UNET, which I was talking about previously. And to quantify the accuracy, I'll be using measures such as the dice similarity coefficient and the mean distance to agreement. Uh, the next step would be the construction of, or the extraction of radi radiomic uh, measures such as SUV, and as well as the development of predictive models. So the CT delineated regions will be co-registered with uh, the PET images, and MIM does that automatically. And then we'll compare those results with what a manual delineator might come up with, as well as see if we can develop some linear regression models to quantify a person's uh, CAC progression over the three months. Um, and lastly, I'll be using a variety of Python libraries, such as NumPy for maths, DICOM, PyCore, uh, DICOM contour for extraction of the contours from the DICOM files, matplotlib for visualization, as well as a couple of deep learning frameworks such as Keras and TensorFlow. And of course, all computational resources are supplied here at the hospital. Um, so some of the potential pitfalls of my project would be a lack of data variability, which may lead to uh, underfitting or overfitting. And to compensate for this, we'll be using a technique known as data augmentation where you artificially expand the size of your data set and uh, introduce variability that you might expect to see in a real life data set um, to sort of improve the model's ability to generalize to an actual real life data set. And so that entails performing a series of transformations, rotations, elastic deformations to the original image. And that's especially necessary because in medical data sets, you'd expect a lot of tissue inhomogeneity as well as motion artifacts introducing variability into the slices. Um, secondly, uh, we cannot use certain accuracy metrics. Uh, for instance, if you take a look here, if my model was supposed to predict the image on the left, it could simply output the image on the right, which obviously still gets 99% of the pixels correct, but evidently that gives us no information, so it's useless to us. So, to compensate, we use measures such as the DICE coefficient and the Jacquard index, which measure overlap, and the mean distance to conformity, which measure the separation. All right, so why would we actually bother with this? Well, firstly, it would massively streamline the clinical workflow. If we consider how many people actually suffer from cardiovascular diseases, the data set and the demand is massive, and a single pass on a convolutional neural network takes minutes versus hours for a manual delineator. 
and these resources could therefore be invested elsewhere in the clinical workflow. Secondly, the results are far more reliable. Once a model has been trained, the results are fully deterministic. So if you supply an image, if you feed an image to the model today or a month later, you're going to get the exact same. It's immune to fatigue and into um, view of bias. And thirdly, it sets a benchmark for future research. So the relative successes and failures of this will help us to understand how we might best integrate deep learning techniques into the workflow. Um, so obviously I've been working on this for a little while. So majority of my time has been spent extracting the, the data from MIM. Um, so as we can see here, for a given Z value, we have a CT image, the corresponding PET, and then the ground truth, which in this case would correspond to the aortic arch. Um, so a lot of time was spent taking that off MIM and getting it onto the computer, where I could subsequently plug it into the model. Uh, this was just some preliminary testing I did on 2D multi-res unit, um, and we achieved a dice score of around 0.45 on the validation set, which is not great, but it's reasonable. It's a reasonable start to work from. And this is just a quick summary of my lit review. As you can see here, there's not a whole lot of work of deep learning work specific to NAF PET imaging. Um, we only had one paper that I could find. However, there's a variety of uh, deep learning architectures which are tried and tested, not only on cardiac substructure delineation, but a range of, of things such as neuro, uh, neuronic uh, delineation, liver delineation, a lot of things. And that's my references. Thank you. Jake. Good talk, Ed. Cheers. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is there plans to extract radial width features other than just SUV? Um, or are you just sort of sticking to the... At the moment, we've only, well, I've only examined looking at SUV, but I imagine there's quite a lot of information encoded in those which we could use to correlate the CT score at baseline and follow up. So I'm still at the stage, I'm not going to, so actually it's not too far. Um, so I'm still at the second stage, which is developing the model for the delineation. When I get to that, I'm sure I'll explore some different. Also, we have the geometric radiomic measures, which I'd like to look at as well. Scott. Yeah, so I actually, I mentioned before that preliminary testing was done with 2D multi-res unit, which is a bit of a cop-out, because what it actually does is it performs 2D convolutions on each of the slices, and then once you've got a prediction on each of those slices, simply slaps them together to form a 3D segmentation. So it doesn't actually leverage any of the data or the contextual information that's present along the z-axis. So there's a couple of ways you can actually um, uh, manipulate the 3D contextual information. The first is to use 3D convolutional kernels, which as you might expect is just a traditional convolutional kernel in three dimensions. Um, the principal disadvantage of this is it can be quite computationally expensive, but it does supply great results. In fact, this is what 3D UNet use and there is a 3D variant of um, multi-resnet, which I'd like to explore as well. A second option would be triplanar models, which use uh, convolutions on three orthogonal axes. Um, you might remember this if you've seen Jake's presentation. He did something very similar, where he had a model looking at the sagittal, coronal, and the axial plane, and they all intersect at a voxel, and the prediction for that voxel is an accumulation of those three models. Um, the biggest disadvantage of this is the data sets are very often anisotropic in their dimensions. So the z-axis is a lot longer than um, the x and the y-axis, which complicates the use of um, some of the kernels. Um, and thirdly, there's uh, recurrent neural networks. And what they do is, after they've made a prediction, they feed that prediction back into the next work for the next prediction. So it's sort of like leveraging the information from one slice in order to make a prediction on the next slice which makes sense because you'd expect the information to be quite similar between slices. Good. Brian? Yeah. Oh. Uh, sorry, um, I might be talking over the top of the um, I may be misremembering, but I think this is one of the um, diseases where male and female patients can present quite differently. Have you got um, sexes as a guest data to train your neural network from? No, I haven't actually. And I'll have to look because... I'm quite certain the data would be encoded in the DICOM files on MIM, 
but I'm not 100% sure. That's a really great point, which I'll um, look into during I testing. Might, I might be misremembering, but I think this is one way male and female present differently. No, thank you for pointing that out. That's, that does sound very important. <laughs> Andrew? Um, yeah, so you explained that really well for a second. I thought um, <laughs> Yeah, so frankly, the biggest workload is actually just preparing the data set. So obviously, I've spent quite a few months extracting from MIM, getting it into a format where I can just feed it in. It's quite customary to just take models that you find off the internet, because it's been tried and tested in Google competitions and all that. There is, however, a lot of customization you can do in a certain model, and that's called hyperparameter uh, customization. So I mentioned before, but there are many things you can change, such as the learning rate in a particular algorithm, um, any second now. So the learning rate would be quite useful because if you imagine that black line is the path your model takes over uh, the, ex uh, the extent of its training, you don't want it to overshoot or you don't want it to take steps that are too big in the sense that it might overshoot one of those local minima or global minima. So you can, for instance, adjust the learning rate to reduce as you continue through training. Uh, there are different, for instance, optimizers you can use which slightly adjust that formula. So there's a lot of, lot of changes you can make to the model itself. But the core sort of structure, uh, which is what you see there, is quite consistent. And Brani, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I cut off Brani before. <laughs> I have been considering that with um, what I've done at the moment. Let's see if I can find. Yeah, so, so for instance, this image you see here isn't actually the base image we exported from MIM. Um, it's actually been zoomed in to cut out a lot of um, the unnecessary pixels. So that's, for instance, one step I've been taking to reduce the, the computational load on the computer. Um, a couple of other steps is, I haven't actually looked into it a lot, but applying different filters to extract features. I found a really cool thing, which is if you apply a filter to the segmented area, it actually completely overhauls the rest of the image, and it's just that segmented area that's, uh, that appears after the filter. That's a bit unclear, but unfortunately, you sort of need the segmented area in order to apply that filter. So I was trying to look at a way to generalize that. Um, I'm sure I'll be asking you guys that during the, the meeting on Monday. Yeah, and Riley? Uh, uh, it seems like, you're, like just in your, your study that you're basing it on, you would use, um, I think, mean, like, four wheels. It might be a while. So oh. the first block, if the chasing F and A steps in, is there a reason they use that? Uh, yeah, actually. So the reason the PET scan is so efficient, um, there's a couple of sort of pharma dynamics specific to that particular compound which are useful in this study. Uh, one is the reason it's so effective at binding to those microcalcifications is because of the shape of them are the very convex, convex, no, yeah, convex and complex which maximizes that surface to area, surface to volume ratio. Uh, compare that to the macrocalcifications, it can't really penetrate inside which is why uh, you don't see uptake in regions which have stable plaque. Um, and also, it's just got some very preferential sort of uh, dynamics, which is a rapid uptake time and a sort of slow dissociation time. And after about 60 minutes, you get pretty good background interference uh, due to uh, uh, exponential decay from uh, the blood and the surrounding regions of the body. So yeah, there's a, there's a couple of reasons why this particular compound is very effective for the study. Yeah. I've got the published ones, for example. Are any, any of them available as like a starting point? Yeah, so, so hundreds, frankly. Um, so UNET, UNET, multi-res UNET, 3D. Particularly for cardiac structure segmentation, are there any already established? Yeah, yeah, for sure, actually. I think if I'll go back to my literature review, uh, the first column with the cardiac-specific study, for instance, we've got a 3D UNET, a regional, uh, fully connected, neural net and a UNET 
variant which are all specific to cardiac delineation. Obviously, the exact structures they're delineating changes between the studies, but it is a proof of concept that it can be applied to the cardiac region. Um, can you, I'm, I'm, 3D UNET is very general, you definitely can. I'll have to look into the regional, the second one and uh, the third one. But if you can do some transfer learning, yeah, I imagine you might be. Um, for those of you who don't know, transfer learning is essentially piggybacking off a data set which has been piggybacking a model which has been trained on a similar data set and then doing some additional training on your data set where the model's already learned to extract pertinent features. Um, yeah, I'll definitely have to look into that, but I, I, this is all very open source, so it's very highly likely I'd be able to find a model uh, and uh, the weights online. Yeah. Um, but it's also fortunate because they've only got 49 patients and you got a lot more. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, were they looking at aorta or, or um, coronary artery? There were three regions. It was just aorta. Um, I think, I can't remember off the top of my head. Here we go. So they delineated uh, abdominal, aorta, aortic arch, and thoracic. I think I pronounced that correct. Um, so no coronary artery analysis, which obviously is something I'd like to explore. So, that's a good gap. Cool. Okay, thank you.